Well, how many are ready for the word today? Oh, but you did come ready for this, right? So here we go. We're ready to start this brand new series called Neighborliness. I don't know if I've ever heard that word before. Everybody say it out loud. Neighborliness, finding the beauty of God across dividing lines. Let me tell you how this happened. How many of you believe in, in divine connections? You believe God orders our steps, everybody? I don't think anything happens by chance. And so I, here I am at a, at a New Jersey Teen Challenge golf outing. Uh, I, I didn't hit very many good shots. But anyway, I'm, I'm leaving and I'm in, in the car with a fellow pastor and somebody tapped on my window. I rolled it down. He handed me this book. I said, Pastor Russ, you have got to read this book. Neighborliness, finding the beauty of God across dividing lines. And I go, okay. And I just kind of took it out of his hand and I thought, I'll take this home and put it on the pile with the rest of the books people have given me to read. So I went home and I sat at, uh, I was really on my wife's desk where she works from home. And um, we were prayerfully considering what to do for our life group series. And we were looking and praying about a lot of things. And I reached over to this book and I thought, I wonder, could this be it? And I set it back down and there were two reasons I didn't want to do it. Number one, the word neighborliness didn't sound spiritual enough for me. <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit spoke to me, kind of rocked me and said, wait a minute, isn't loving your neighbor the second greatest commandment Jesus ever gave us? And so that one didn't work. And then I thought, finding the beauty of God across dividing lines. And uh, when it comes to crossing dividing lines, I really didn't want to deal with it anymore. It's not comfortable. How many know it's not comfortable to get out of your comfort zone? It's more comfortable to hang with people that look like me, live like me, worship like me, vote like me. It, it, that's the comfort zone. And so I, I, I all set it down again because I thought I didn't want to do that. But God reminded me that growth and comfort never coexist. And I, I thought, I thought finding the beauty of God across dividing lines, I thought what an on time message. What an on-time message. Our nation is more divided, I think, than it has ever been. It's the most divisive culture. It's divi divided politically. I've never seen it more polarized, ever. Racially divided, economically divided. And I want this church to know that government does not have the answer. Republicans don't have it. Democrats don't have the answer. Our culture does not have the answer. The only hope, for a divided world is a united church. The only hope for a divided culture is a united church, a church that loves God, loves their neighbor, and has the courage to step across dividing lines. That's, that's what God was speaking to me. And I want to jump into this and give you the text to lay the foundation for the series. We're going to talk about three things today. Loving God, loving your neighbor, and following Jesus. Can we do that in about 20 minutes? 25? Here we go. One day like every other day. Jesus was talking with some religious leaders. They were debating him. They were always looking to get Jesus with a gotcha question. And so I'm going to take you to the text, Mark 12, 28 to 31. I'd like you to follow along. The words are up on the screen or there on your TV or computer screen. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, asked Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? What a question. Remember we talked last week, last week in Jewish religion there were over 600 laws, moral and ceremonial laws, over 600, and he asked Jesus, which one is, is the most important? Jesus said the most important is, hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I'm going to get to that in a minute because he really didn't answer the question there. Next verse he does. He says, and you shall love the Lord your God, read it with me, come on, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Keep going. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment 
greater than these. Wow. Now, did you notice Jesus didn't just start out with love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? He started out with, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That wasn't the answer to the question. So why did he say it? You need to know that the Hebrew people would greet each other. Am I right, Pastor Matt? They would greet each other with this saying. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Let's say it together. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You see, they, they did that. And Jesus, what he was doing here, he was recalibrating their hearts and minds. Walk with me. The Hebrew people, the Jewish people, held to monotheism. Monotheism, which is the worship of one God. Now, the culture around them and all of the ungodly pagan nations embraced polytheism, which is the worship of many gods. And one of Israel's greatest sins, they were constantly being lured away and seduced by the pagan cultures to worship their gods. And so what was Jesus doing? Before he said, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he was reminding them to come back to the one true God. Amen to that. You know what? The church today is no different. I know we, we think about following other gods and idols. We go, wow, thank God that's not me. But the church today is constantly under this lure or a seduction of the world to worship other gods. Oh, hold on a minute. And the Hebrew people didn't always totally leave the worship of God to worship pagan gods. They would worship both. They'd worship God a little bit, and they'd worship other pagan gods. And Jesus says, you need to come back to the one true God. Today, the church continues right now to be lured away, drawn away, seduced by the gods of this world. What are they, Pastor Russ? Oh, money's probably the biggest god. I didn't expect you to say amen there. That's okay. That's okay. There's money. In fact, it's anything that we put more important than Jesus. There's the money God. There's the power God. There's the position God. There's the sex God, beauty, approval. We're constantly, by culture, like they were, being lured away to prioritize other things over Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> but Jesus, I remember, said, no man can serve two masters. You will love one and hate the other or cling to one and despise the other, but you cannot serve God and riches. Now, so if loving God, watch this, and loving our neighbor are the two greatest commandments, what do you think the devil's strategy is? If loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving our neighbor as ourselves, what do you think, I'm gonna call him for who he is, Satan the devil. What do you think his strategy is? I'll tell you, to distract you from loving God and to divide us from each other. That's it, that's it. If those are the two greatest commandments, he wants to distract us from worship and divide us from each other. When it comes to distracting us from loving or worshiping God, a pastor friend of mine put out something, I think it was on Twitter, I looked at it, and it was a conversation between a Christian and the devil. And they each only said one thing. And the Christian said, if I gotta wear a mask, I ain't going to church. And the devil said, that was easy. It's to distract us from loving and worshiping God. Busy, and, and, and think about it, I don't, I don't want to meddle here too much, but you know, the hours we spend on Facebook and social media, and uh, like I always say, we ought to get off of Facebook and get your face in this book. You know, and, and some, you know, I, I've, I've gotten up in the morning and checked, you know, the news, headlines, and Facebook, and Twitter, Instagram, and then I get, got, get into the scriptures. I've changed that whole way. I want to get to God before the world gets to me. I said, I want to get to God before the world gets to me. And so, and so rather than check social media or the news headlines, I want to hear what Jesus has to say first thing. Come on, amen. Not only to, to distract us from worshiping and loving God, don't miss this, everybody. Because it's very easy to get lured away. Oh, now I'm not saying we leave God. We just put him on the circumference of our life. I call it God in a box. When he wants to be the very center of our life. 
And then not only distract us from worshiping God, but to divide us from each other. And, and I don't know, I, I, get, I get so uh, grieved in my spirit when I see Christians attacking each other. On Facebook, you know, it's very easy to hide behind a screen and shoot poison at people. And, uh, and so when Christians are taking aim at each other on social media over politics, just tell somebody you're voting for Trump and you'll have a Christian correct you fast. Or tell them you're voting for Biden. Doesn't matter. Or they, or, or, or they shoot darts on whether or not the church should be open or not. And then unbelievers see Christians going at it and they go, look, they can't even love each other. How are they going to help me? They're so divided, they can't even, they can't even, how are they going to help me? And I'm reminded of the words of Jesus. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one for another. He wants to divide the church from each other, but he also wants to divide us from the culture. He wants us to look at the TV, and I've been guilty of this, looking at the TV and just getting flat out angry at, at, at others who, different political persuasion or, or different race or, or whatever. And, and, and the devil, if he can, if he can get, a, get in there and divide us so that we dislike people different from us, we'll never cross a dividing line. If he can get us to dislike and distance ourselves from the poor, from a different race, from somebody of a different political persuasion, somebody in a different income bracket than me, or maybe they're not here, or maybe they're not here legally, so they don't belong, they just need to go back. Wait! If he can divide us from each other, he's one. And if he can keep us divided so that we're all in the church singing kumbaya, praising Jesus, but yet we can't cross over a line and touch somebody that's hurting, we better get some fresh religion. Amen to that. Amen to that. Now, so let's go with first things first. Everybody say first things first. And that's loving God. He said, love God with all of your heart, verse 30, with all of your soul, with all your mind, and with all of your strength. And this multiplicity of words here, it emphasizes the fervency that we are to love God with everything that is in us. Not some compartmentalized love for God that's good for Sunday morning. Can I just say that we don't automatically love God? None of us were born loving God. We're born loving ourselves. So our love for God, you know, you know where our love for God comes from? Our love for God, it's not another rule to follow. I said it's not another rule to follow. It comes out of a relationship with Jesus. You see, you see true love for God. So when he said, well, you know, here's the most important command, he wasn't giving them another rule. He was inviting them into relationship. Really, love for God, our love for God is in response to his love for us. And it's in response to what he has done for us. Let me read you a verse, 1 John 4, 9. I love this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God. He loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Somebody say amen to that. We love him because he first loved us. So when you, to love God, look back over your life and look at the canvas. And how many of you, when you look back over your life, would say, if it wasn't for the Lord that was on my side, I would have been swallowed up alive. If it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't be here today. If that's you, shout an amen out loud. If it wasn't for Jesus. So when you get out of love with God, or you say, Pastor, I just need to love God more. Let me invite you to pump the brakes, hit the pause button, and look back over your life, and you'll see his fingerprints all over it, and you'll be able to sing and shout the victory. <laughs> I can say, thank God I was lost. Was anybody in here just flat out lost? And he brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. I was blind and now I see. I would have died that night. I remember one night, I just throw this in. I remember one night I was crazy. I was 18 years old and I got away from God. I was crazy. Any of you ever crazy at 18? 
Lord Jesus. And my, I met this girl in Buffalo, and she took me to some party. I didn't realize it until way later, somebody had drugged my drink. And the, all I remember is getting in the car, and I remember... It's about an hour drive from there to my little country home at 18 years old. And all I remember is the only part of that drive is going around a curve. Somewhere at three o'clock in the morning, I get home. And when I look back over that, I was so out of my mind on something that if it hadn't been Jesus taking the wheel, I said, if it hadn't been Jesus, I might be dead today. I, I don't know. And how about you? You don't know how many times God has spared your life. And when I stop and look back, I, I, I think like David in Psalm 116. I love it. He says, I love the Lord because he heard my voice. I love the Lord because he heard my cry. Listen to what he said. Death had a hold on me. And when I called on the name of the Lord, he says, death had a hold on me. And when I called on the Lord, he delivered me. He delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from falling, and I will love the Lord. Somebody say amen out loud. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I, I know you say, well, and I'm not where I want to be, but thank you. God, I'm not where I used to be. I love the Lord. I love, and, and I, you know, sometimes when I say, I love, Lord, I love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, he'll remind me that I don't. And that it's something I'm still working on. Anybody else got room for growth in that area? I just think when we stop, Pastor Matty, we stop and look back at what the Lord has done for us, it'll make you shout the praises of God. Amen, amen. You know, uh, that's the first commandment, everybody, Okay. Are you with me? You want to talk about rules? This is the first commandment. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let's stop with the Sunday morning God and the God in the box or when I'm in trouble. If you only pray when you're in trouble, you're in trouble. And get Jesus off the edge of your life and at the center of your life. And the more you worship him, the more you will love him. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. And the more you're in love with him, the less likely you will be seduced by the gods of this world. The more you are in love with your husband and wife, you, you wanna know who's guilty of having affairs? Is it when a spouse, when spouses grow apart from each other? You don't wanna hear this. When they grow apart from each other, there's no real conversation, there's no real communication, there's no real intimacy. And when you fall out of love for each other, it's not long before someone else lures them away. But when you're sold out, head over heels, in love with your wife or your husband, how many know you're not easily lured away? And the world is constantly trying to lure us away. Follow money. Go after sex. Make it your God. Go after position and power. Get another degree. Get some more letters after your name. Nothing wrong with that unless we've got to lay Jesus aside to go that direction. And the, this culture is always luring us away. And I come to remind you, the Lord our God is one. You cannot serve God and this world at the same time. And the more you fall in love with him, the more you realize how much he loves you, the more you will love him. And that's the great commandment. And the second one, he says, is to love your neighbor. And I want to tell you, if we don't get the first commandment right, you'll never do the second. Because you're in your flesh, you are not going to love people of a different race, people out of different culture, you, you're not automatically going to love them. And you want to know what? If we don't get the first commandment right, the neighborliness will be a nice sermon series that comes and goes and your life will be the same. We've got to get a hold of the first one because we, 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 can't, we can't cross dividing lines. You mean, you, mean, you mean I should talk to the, somebody in the LGBTQ community? You, 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 you mean I should actually have a conversation with them? rather than throw Leviticus at him? By the way, this, as soon as you want to use Leviticus, sit down. Because the minute you try to keep one law, you better be ready to keep them all. So pastor, you mean you want me, you mean, you mean, you mean I, 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 it's, I should have coffee with an illegal? 
If, the, if we don't do this, if we don't, you will never cross dividing lines out of your own flesh. It's got to come from the overflow of the love of God. I said the overflow of the love of God will make me love people of a different race, different color, different culture, different sexual orientation. I, I, I'm saying that people are lost. Lost. And, we're, and so the church, we love coming in and raise a hallelujah. We love to raise a hallelujah, but Jesus said it's time to step across some lines and show people the love of Jesus. Neighborliness, if you will. 1 John 4, 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. I love the 16th verse, so we know, and read this with me, rely on the love of God God has for us. I am not rely, loving my neighbor. I am not relying on Russ Hodgins, his willpower, or his willingness to get out of his comfort zone. I am relying on the love of God because naturally we stay with our own kind. Come on now. Our natural man stays with our own kind, hang with people that live like us, look like us, make the same kind of money as us, vote like us, worship like us. It takes an overflow of the love of God to cross the line. Because if we, if the church doesn't, who will? The answer for a divided world is a united church. So who's our neighbor? It's not just the people next door. And it's not dependent on those in your zip code. Our neighbors are people who look different than us, not in the same income bracket as us, don't vote the same as us, who may not even be legal. Jesus says, love them. Because you want to know why? Every person on this planet has been made in the image of God. Amen. Every person. In fact, there's a verse in the Bible that says, we are not born by the will of man or the will of flesh. We're born by the will of God. So if somebody is on this planet, God has a purpose for their life. And they just need redemption like you and I did. God has a plan for them. The people that you're screaming at, at the TV. God has a plan for their life. Levi Lusco is a pastor I follow on Twitter. He said this, and I had to write it down and share it with you. He said, the God, I quote, the gospel is not just something that gets us to heaven. The gospel is a sledgehammer that smashes down the walls that separate us. Amen. Wow. Let me give you the definition of neighborliness. We don't have much more time. Everybody, let's read it together. It's up on the screen. And you at home. Neighborliness is the behavior of Christians who seek to embody the love, understanding, curiosity, kindness, and care of Jesus. Let me give you the last point of my message. I said, we talked about loving God, loving neighbors. I don't know if I put the loving neighbors up. And number three, follow Jesus. Everybody say, follow Jesus. He's our example. Yeah. His whole life showed us how to love others with open arms. And I know what you're saying. Yeah, but I'm not Jesus. I'm glad you brought that up. Jesus is our example. Has anybody ever looked at the example of Jesus and people said, be more like Jesus? And you go, I can't. Well, he said you can. I said he said you can. Watch this, watch this, follow Jesus. John 14, 12. Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to my Father. And what he meant by that is he would send the Holy Spirit. Now, I know what you're thinking. And you know what, Pastor Matt? God lit me up with this this week. So when we say, Jesus said, the works I do, you shall do, I've always thought, well, that's a healing ministry. You know, lay hands on. You say, well, how do the works of Jesus I mean heal people and raise the dead and open the eyes of the blind and touch and heal the crippled people? and preach sermons that pierce the heart with great authority and, and oratory. But I think there's other works that he did. Jesus intentionally met people across ethnic, religious, economic, gender, and generational lines. He didn't just hang out with people like him. Can I, in the last, just last couple of minutes that I have, um, can I share some of the works that Jesus did? Beyond healing the lepers and uh, raising the dead and preaching great sermons, he had a conversation with a Samaritan woman one day who had five husbands and the dude she was sleeping with now was not her husband. That was six. And then Jesus, the seventh man, came along. Not to abuse her, 
but to heal her. Listen to this. She was a Samaritan. Jews hated Samaritans. They were, you know who the Samaritans were? They were Jewish people who intermarried with pagan nations. In today's language, they would have called her a half-breed. They despise Samaritans. Jesus is having a conversation with her because she's so lost she can't find her way. And Jesus loves her. And the disciples show up and say, what's he doing talking to her? That's how they say it in Brooklyn. What's he doing talking to her? Why is he wasting his time with a half-breed? I remember the cry of a beggar. Jesus, have mercy on me. And there's a verse in the Bible that says, when that blind Bartimaeus cried out to Jesus, Jesus stood still. The cry of a beggar stopped the Messiah in his tracks. <laughs> and he called the beggar and he healed him. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus talked with the Samaritan woman. A beggar stopped him in his tracks. He forgave a convicted criminal. I said he forgave a convicted criminal at his last moment and ushered him into the kingdom of God. Jesus loved the children when everybody else said, get those kids out of here. He encouraged a rich man to pursue spiritual riches, so he talked to the poor, he talked to the rich. He was always crossing the line. <laughs> he was always crossing the line. And he talked to a rich man about pursuing heavenly riches and not earthly wealth. He spent extravagant amounts of time with those who were in pain and those who had suffered severe injustice. He crossed the dividing lines. He challenged the status quo. He consistently interacted with people who were different from him. And I love the verse that says, he left the 99 to find one. He left, 90, he left all the church righteous people and chased down one. And I know that seems illogical, irrational, and senseless, but that's the kind of love Jesus modeled, and that's the kind of love he wants us to model. Amen. Stand with me, please. Okay, we're done. We gotta be done. We gotta be done. This hour thing is tough. I don't wanna be just another church down the road that opens up on Sunday and we just gather and it's, it's wonderful to gather to worship God. There's a world that's gone mad out there and it's a world that's lost and they're broken and they're hurting and you see stuff on TV and, and it's easy to get angry with other people but they're just lost. And we do crazy things out of our lostness. And I don't want to just do church, people. I don't. And I believe that this can be life-changing if we could realize God wants us to get out of ourself. I said out of ourself. And reach other people that are different than we are. 1 John 4, 11, one more time. Dear friends, since God has loved us, we all to love one another. Verse 16, and we know and rely on the love God has for us. You know, everybody, this command to love your neighbor, how many, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many say, that's kind of overwhelming. It is. It's a whole lot easier just to hang with people like me, live like me, look like me, vote like me, think like me. But the good news of that scripture, could you put that back up? 1 John 4, 16. We rely on the love God has for us. I'm not relying on willpower. I'm not relying on hyped up emotions. I'm not relying on human effort. I'm relying on being filled with the love of God. Loving him and him loving me until I'm living out of the overflow of the love of God. Amen to that. You'll never do it in your own. Let's look to him for our help. Could I just say this as the last word? The gospel of Jesus Christ is not just about God's love for you. It's about God's love through you. Can you say amen to that? The gospel is not just about God's love for you. It's God's love through you. And then we'll be the church that he's called us to be. Amen. Let's sing this song with the team together in closing.